Good morning to all. It is good to be here and certainly good to see all that are able to be with us for our worship service this morning. I know in this time it's a very different and strange time. We don't get to meet in this fashion as frequently as we do under normal circumstances, so it's an extra blessing to get to actually see one another. Appreciate Brother James's prayer, and I'm sure many of us have been praying and ask that we continue to pray for the situation. We look forward to the time when this pandemic and this crisis will be over. Looks like things are getting better, and we hope that they continue to do that, because I know all of us want our lives to get back to normal in many ways, not least of which is our ability to be together as brothers and sisters in Christ at the assemblies and in other opportunities throughout the week that we usually get to spend together. I want to talk for just a little while this morning about some words that are found in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, and we'll read those here in just a moment. Uh, But James talks about trials. It's the way he begins his letter. And he has some interesting things to say about trials. And actually, as we'll see in our sermon, James is not alone in the way he views suffering and the way he views trials. And that is very different than the way that the world looks at trials. You may wonder about the title, The Joyous Trail of Trials. When we think of trials and suffering and problems, rarely do we associate that with joy. When we think of what makes you happy or what makes me happy, usually the first thing on that list is not, well, I like to suffer. When I suffer or when I go through difficult times, that really brings some joy to my life. That's not a typical answer. In fact, when we think of trials and problems and difficulties, we think of stress, we think of worry, we think of sadness, despair. And yet the Bible teaches us a message, again, multiple times, and we're going to focus on James, but this is found in some other places, that it's actually in times of trial, in times of even suffering and difficulty, that the Christian should find joy and continue to possess joy. I think that's a very fitting message for what we're going through right now. I know that this pandemic is causing a lot of problems. There are people that are not able to work and they are financially in some difficult situations. There are people who are having problems uh, just managing their household because of the changes. Again, religious lives have been uh, tossed around a bit. We, Many of us like to try and meet two and three times a week, and that just isn't able to happen the way that it normally does. In other places, it's even much more difficult than what we have here. And on top of that, of course, those are all just the byproducts. There's the constant fear of well, what if I get sick? What if one of my loved ones gets this virus? This is seemingly a, a, a difficult virus, sometimes a deadly virus. Um, and so there's constant worry and fear. And so this is, in one sense, a trial. That's not the only type of trial we'll face, but it is a type of trial. And so I want to talk for just a little while about what James has to say. And hopefully we all find some encouragement and some things to maybe learn and work on. Uh, from what James has to say during this time period. We'll just start. We're going to read the first four verses of the book of James. He opens, it says, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing." James, if you read through the book of James, you'll find that he is very direct. Um, He does not beat around the bush. It's not that he is uneloquent, but he is just quite plain spoken. In fact, because of that, it's a very easy book. I say easy, it's easy to understand. James is a very challenging book to put into practice sometimes. But it's a very practical book. It's, and sometimes it's been referred to as the Proverbs of the New Testament because it's much like Proverbs. It give, he uses short, simple statements that really get the point across. Sometimes it's very direct that, in the way that James writes. And his opening is that way. He says, uh, he mentions himself, he mentions he's a servant of God, he mentions who he's writing to. I believe that 12 tribes in the dispersion is a reference to the church. And then he says, greetings, 
And that's all, that's all there is for the niceties. That's all there is for the introduction. Now Paul, oftentimes in his letters, sometimes he doesn't, but most times Paul has some pretty long introductions. Usually it takes a couple of verses just for Paul to get through stating him, his apostleship through the Lord Jesus Christ by the will of God, grace, mercy, and peace. It's a little bit more than just this greetings. And then sometimes he starts off with these lengthy passages of praise or of thanksgiving. If you've been able to join our Colossian study on Wednesday nights, you might remember that in Colossians 1, Paul spends several verses talking about the prayers he prays for the Colossian brethren. And that leads him into then giving a praise to Christ who is supreme and who is preeminent. But James just says, this is James, I'm writing to the church, greetings, and then boom, let's get in to the direct point of the matter. And it's right off the bat, it's exhortation. He says, Count it all joy. Now that might not sound like a command, but when you look at it, this is essentially a command. This is an exhortation. He begins immediately by saying, by the way, I know you're probably suffering and this is how you need to respond. Suffering is a theme throughout the book of James. I'll leave it to you to read that book. It's a short book. You could probably read it in 15 to 20 minutes or less. Um, and I challenge you to try and do that in one setting sometime this week and just see how many times James brings up suffering or suffering for Christ. And this is the very first thing that he launches into, probably because the Christians he was writing to in the first century were suffering. There were trials that they were facing. There were problems that they were having to deal with. And so he begins with what they need to hear. An encouragement, an exhortation, a command, yes, but an exhortation to count it all joy, and thus to endure the trials that they were facing. Now that's, as we've already mentioned, is one of the interesting things about this passage. As James says, count it all joy. Basically, think of this times, regard these times of trial as a joyous time, as an opportunity, as a reason for joy and rejoicing. And we might think that's really strange. And the world looks at that and thinks that's really strange. But do you know where that attitude really comes from? It comes from Jesus. In fact, James actually begins his book in a very similar way to Jesus and how he began his Sermon on the Mount. Remember in Matthew chapter 5, we won't read all of these, but remember how Jesus begins that great sermon that takes up Matthew chapter 5 through 7. He begins with that section we call the Beatitudes in which Jesus pronounces several blessings. But that word blessing is a word that essentially means happy, blessed. And Jesus gives these lists. He talks about who it is that's blessed, who it is that can have joy or be happy and they're very different reasons than what the world would think. The world, again, often thinks, well, you can be happy with things, with money, with people. Jesus says, blessed are those, or happy are they, who are poor in spirit. Those who mourn, or verse 10, those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. The very bedrock foundation of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount was that real joy and real blessedness does not come from the circumstances of this earthly life, but from faithfulness to God. And that's such a wonderful promise because even when we are persecuted, even when we mourn, even when we're poor in spirit, even when we are these other things that the world might look down upon, we can have and possess and maintain true joy. And James begins his letter in essentially the same way. Now, obviously a little bit different wording, a little bit more direct, but he is going to pronounce a blessing that we'll see at the very end of the sermon that's very similar to this. And he begins with this message that joy can be found in trials. Now, as I mentioned, the world finds joy in a lot of things. You know, when people are healthy, they tend to be happy. Now, sometimes we're happier when we get better from a sickness. Sometimes we take our health for granted and we get sick. Or in a time like this where sickness is all around us and we realize how precious health can be, we place joy in happiness in being healthy. We place joy in possessions. People find joy in their homes and their cars and their toys and the various things that they own or possess or the money that allows them to buy those things. We find joy in people. There's nothing wrong with finding joy in people. We love our families. We love our friends. We should love our family and our friends. But sometimes that is the primary source of joy. But the problem with all of these things, if our joy is based upon even people or money or possessions or health, what is true of all of these things? They can be lost, they can be stolen, they can die, 
we can lose them. If your joy is wrapped up in your health, what happens when you contract a deadly virus? What happens when you get cancer? What happens when you have an accident that takes your health away from you? It leads to despair. It leads to depression. It leads to leaving faithfulness behind. That's happened to people before because their real joy came from their health and their ability. Other people, on the other hand, I've known of people that have lost health, lost ability, or just faced the difficulties of older age, and yet remained not only faithful, but joyful. Because despite the aches and the pains or the difficulties that they faced in their health, their joy was not based on their circumstances, but on godliness. Or again, possessions. There have been people who have made millions of dollars only to lose everything. That would be a terrible thing. It, there's people that don't ever make millions of dollars and they lose everything. There's people that never make that much in the first place. That can lead to a discouraging existence if your love revolves around money. But if you are like Paul and you can find contentment in whatever state you are and realize that contentment with godliness is great gain, then even in the most despairing of times financially, you can still have joy and faithfulness in even people we all know the sad fact of this life is that people leave us. Even people that are dear and true to us may get an illness themselves or pass away or be involved in an accident. Or sometimes people simply let us down and people that we thought were wonderful friends turn out to not be such wonderful friends. How can we overcome those times? By placing our joy in the right things. And the joy of the Christian should be in hope. Now, how can we be joyful when we lose our health? How can we be joyful when we lose our possessions? How can we be joyful when we are persecuted? Because our hope is in things that cannot be taken away. As Jesus said again in the Sermon on the Mount, He talked about laying up treasure in heaven where thieves can't steal, where rust and moths, can, and moths cannot destroy. He's speaking about a treasure that cannot be lost. Money, people, fame, all these things can be taken away. Serving God cannot be taken away. At the end of the day, if you're faithful to God, the knowledge that He is pleased with you and loves you is something that no circumstance can change. That should bring us a great deal of joy and comfort. Salvation is something that cannot be taken from you. Now, can you... Give up your salvation? Can you choose to rebel against God and lose your salvation? I believe the Bible teaches you can. But it cannot be taken from you. There is no person, there is no force, no power, not even Satan himself can take away your salvation. There is no thief that can break in and steal your crown of life. Whatever else you lose in this earth, know that you do, will not lose your salvation as long as you remain faithful to the Lord. That should be an incredible encouragement, an incredible blessing. And because salvation is ours, eternal life is ours. Cancer may ravage our bodies. Accidents may cut our lives short. All sorts of terrible things can happen in this life. But there is a life that does not end, and that is promised to the faithful. Why would I give up eternal life? For the passing and fleeting things of this life that can be taken away and lost in the first place. Instead, why not place joy in that which will last forever? When we truly understand these things and realize that the Christian's hope cannot be taken away, then the Christian's joy cannot be taken away. And even in difficult times, and that's easy to say, in good times, when we actually do have our health and we do have our money and we've got people around us, that's easy to say. But then when it all starts to fall apart, that's a different story. That's also why we need to prepare, why we need to grow. And that's why when we do suffer, instead of giving up, instead of complaining, instead of worrying and stressing, we need to recognize it for what it is, an opportunity to grow even stronger. That's what James says in verse 3. He explains why it is that we can count it all joy when we suffer various trials. He says, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. We'll talk about that word in just a moment. But the reason here is essentially that we can count it joy is because through trials, one of the reasons to count it joy anyway, 
is that it benefits us spiritually. It gives us the opportunity to grow. Now, this is a point that I think is very important to Christianity. Because as I've already said, Jesus talks about this to a degree in the Sermon on the Mount. And then James mentions it. And two other authors, not just in two other books, but two other authors in the New Testament basically touch on the same idea. Paul says in Romans 5, verses 3 through 5, and I encourage you to go read the fuller context of this in the next passage, but for time's sake, we're just going to read a few verses. Paul says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Paul's saying very similar things to what James is saying. He says, we can rejoice in our sufferings. Or as James says, count all joy when you suffer various trials. He says the same thing, because suffering produces endurance. I know, because I'm as guilty as anybody, that when times get hard, when we're sick, when we lose something or someone, that the immediate response is often sadness and despair. That's natural. But one of the points of Christianity is to overcome what is often easy and natural. And it takes discipline and it takes work. It takes faithfulness to God to stop and remember, this is a time when I can grow. This is a time when I can learn endurance. And because of that, I can build character. And as I build character and as I endure, guess what it's going to do? It's going to produce even more hope in my life. Peter also mentions this concept. In 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7, he says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Again, very similar to what James says, but what beautiful words. We rejoice even though for a while here we may have to suffer and even be grieved by various trials. But as we endure those things, it reveals something. If we will endure and if we will be faithful then it will prove the genuineness of our faith. Something much more valuable than all the money, all the fame, all the things of this world. Something that will result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus comes back. That's worth more than anything any person or any experience can offer you. And thus a reason we can have joy during times of trial. But back to James, he says that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. That word testing has some different ideas, but one of the ideas that's tied to that is essentially the process of refining silver or gold. When you take gold or silver out of the ground, I don't know if, you, if you've ever seen pictures of it or seen it in person, it's these dirty clumps that really don't look all that nice. Most people wouldn't want to put that around their finger, around their neck, or in their ears, but it goes through a purging process. It goes through a process of refining. Now to do that, that gold, that material has to be heated up. In fact, to the point sometimes of it's melted. But that works out those impurities. And then when it's reformed, it can be this beautiful, shiny metal that's valuable, that's worth a great deal, that's loved by people. But that's a pretty intense process to go from one, the original, to the refined. Well, suffering, trials... They do the same thing for us. We begin rough, with impurities, with some rough around the edges. And it's not an easy life that then turns us into a beautiful Christian. It's a life of trials. It's a life of having to endure. Those things make for a stronger Christian Perhaps you've heard uh, the saying about sailors that calm seas never made for good sailors. A good sailor is one who's had to endure some storms. But as they endure those storms and they learn how to navigate stormy waters, they become a better sailor. They become more adept at facing the difficulties of life or of their job. And the same is true for our life and for our Christianity. But this testing produces steadfastness. Another idea there is endurance. One of the, uh, the technical definition is to bear up under difficult circumstances. The picture that that brings to mind in some cases is think of a weightlifter who has to bear up, who has to stand up under the weight 
of a heavy bar that's laden down with a great deal of weight. That's the idea of what steadfastness is. Now, by the way, how does a weightlifter do that? Could you walk into the gym right now and pick up a bar that maybe weighs two or three hundred pounds and simply pick that up and stand under it? Not if you haven't been doing that. Not if you haven't been trying. Not if you haven't been exercising. But when we go and we exercise and we work, and the men that are able to do this and the women that are able to do this, how did they do that? Well, they start low. They start with what they can lift. And they challenge themselves and they push themselves. And as they do that, they grow. Their muscles strengthen, even though it can be a painful and difficult process. Over time, they become able to lift more and more and more. And so it is spiritually. Sometimes we face some hardships and some difficulties. But as we remain faithful and learn through those processes, we become more adept and more capable at enduring more. And part of that is also that we grow more adept at helping others. You see, sometimes trials are very severe, and we need to remember that young Christians are not quite strong enough yet to face some of those trials. That's when those who are stronger those who have been through more, those who have learned and been through difficulties and trials need to not only take care of themselves, but step in and help others also. And we have a wonderful example, by the way, as we always do, in Jesus. Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. I do not believe that the Hebrew writer was trying to make light of suffering. He would say in a few moments, you have not yet persisted unto bloodshed. But I don't think that that means, uh, as sometimes we kind of say it, look, you haven't, you haven't suffered anything yet. You know, it, people have had it worse than you. Of course, Jesus had it worse than you. That's, that's not the point here. And I think we do a disservice when we try and encourage people by saying, well, look, you know, the first century Christians, they had to meet under the threat of Romans coming in and killing them. So buck up, because it's really not that bad. That really doesn't encourage anybody. That just shames people. What the Hebrew writer is saying is look to your king and what he's willing to do for you and follow his example. Our trials are going to be different. My trials will sometimes be different than your trials. And our trials here in Lawrence County, Tennessee, are going to be different than what our Christian brethren are facing right now over in Kenya or over in other places of the world. Sometimes they're different. And it's not a matter of who has it worst, and so I guess they have it worst, so I should be faithful. It's a matter of we all gain strength from each other. Yes, the first century Christians were persecuted to, to the death. And they provide a wonderful example for us. But we're facing some challenges right now in our own way, in our own right. And we need to learn from the examples of others and learn faithfulness. Not just learn shame and be ashamed that other people face worse, but learn from that example and be encouraged and be exhorted to remember what Jesus was willing to do for me and let that motivate me to be willing to do all that I can for Him. In a moment, when we partake of this memorial feast, this is a wonderful thing. But I want us to remember this is not a checklist item. This is not something that we have gathered here to do just so that we can take a sip of grape juice and eat a little piece of thin bread and check we're a Christian. There is a reason that God gave us this memorial feast. And it wasn't just to do something every seven days. It was to remember His Son and become more like Him. And if we go through this service, and if we go through this memorial feast, and then we go out and we can't endure, or we complain the entire time, or we just live like the world, then what we do here is pretty useless. But this feast, if we will truly partake in it, the way God has required and asked us and commanded us, we can gain some great strength from this.
We can look at our lives in light of what Jesus has done. We can look at our lives and even our problems in light of what Jesus went through for us. And then we can gain the encouragement that we need so very much to go out and then follow Him and give everything that we can for Him. But verse 4, James says, Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Again, this and let is another exhortation. This is a command. As Christians, we are expected to grow through the trials that we face. But the point here is that endurance for endurance sake is not the goal. It's not just a matter of being able to endure more, but it's that endurance enables us to a complete work. That word effect there is actually the same word that is often translated as work or works. Endurance gives us the ability to work for the Lord. And the goal that enable or the goal of endurance enables us to work towards is spiritual maturity. James says when we have endurance it leads to being perfect. Now that word perfect is used slightly differently than we often use it. This does not mean moral perfection. This does not mean perfection without any faults. The real idea there is complete, fully accomplished, fully developed. Now that is not meant to lessen the point of the word there. I'm not saying, well, this is this is you know, this is pretty easy to attain. It's not. Like this is the same word when Jesus says, Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. This is the word there. And of course, God is morally perfect. He is without any defect, any fault. But the idea is supposed to be working towards. It's very easy sometimes to say, Well, you know, I'm human. And we are human. And I do think that we need to have mercy and grace with one another as we have patience and help one another grow. But we also need to be careful. I am. Our expectation is to be growing towards completeness. What have I done to become more complete? How have I endured? How have I worked to become more complete in my service for the Master? That's a question we need to ask ourselves and a challenge we need to set for ourselves. Will we ever reach perfect completion? Not on this side of eternity. But the Bible never gives us an excuse that because we won't reach it perfectly here, that we should stop working for it. It's something we are to continue to strive for. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, it uses this word, uh, but solid food is for the mature. That word mature is the same word, I believe, as the word perfect here. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So James is talking about spiritual maturity, spiritual completeness, which again, as Hebrews says, must be done through practice and through diligence. A very similar word is this idea of complete. This means to be whole or entire. Again, very similar to what we've already said. But the world looks at trials as taking away. You know, when we get sick, that takes something away from us. It takes our health. When the economy crashes, it takes away my finances. Uh, whatever it might be, trials usually take something, and that's all the world sees. But for the Christian, trials actually enable us to gain and to grow. We might ask, well, how is that? Well, one way is they teach us to rely on God. In 2 Corinthians 1, verse 8 and 9, Paul gives a picture of what it was like, and he reminds the Corinthians what it was like when he was uh, preaching the gospel other places of the world. And he says, We do not want you to be unaware, brothers, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Now, Paul's not just bragging here. He's not saying, Look, look at what all I suffered. But listen to verse 9. He says, Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. I always love it. Because it's helpful to me and encouraging to me when I see the apostles learning lessons. Because it reminds me that even the apostles had things to learn. That means I have a lot of things to learn. And Paul says that when he was preaching in Asia, they went through some tribulations that were so difficult that he and his comrades thought that the only possible outcome was their death. But you know what happened through that situation? The man who was already, had already given his life to Christ and was preaching the gospel 
learn to rely on God even more. That's what trials can do. That's what difficulty can do if we allow it. If we will seek faithfulness during times of trial and grow through them, then they will actually bring us closer to God instead of driving us further away. And then James says, not only will we be perfect and complete, but lacking in nothing. Our goal should be to grow to be a complete Christian. Now, one who lacks no motivation, one who lacks no ability to faithfully serve God. That's a very high goal. I will admit sometimes my motivation is lacking. Sometimes, like all the time, it, it feels that the ability just isn't there. We recognize this is a process. We are growing. We are striving. Will we give up? Will we make excuses? Or will we continue to toil and labor even through the most difficult of times so that we will lack nothing in our faithfulness and in our service to God? I want to read, we haven't read this yet, but James 1 verse 12. This sounds a lot like the Beatitudes in a way. But a few verses later, James says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to all those, or to those, who love Him. What a source of joy this promise is. We are not working, we are not laboring, we are not suffering for health, for money, for possessions, or anything that can be lost or stolen. We are seeking an imperishable crown of life that is bestowed by none other than God Himself. This is, rings true to the words of Revelation 2 verse 10, Jesus' words through John to the congregation at Ephesus. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. What a joy to know that such a crown is yours and such a crown is mine, no matter the trials that lie in our way, if only we will endure and grow in our faithfulness to God through those times. Well, the sermon is yours this morning. I hope that this is an encouragement. In a time like this where we are facing some trials, you may think that this isn't too bad. You may think this is the worst thing you've ever seen. I don't want to make light of the situation in any way or anybody's ideas about this situation. I believe many people are facing some severe trials. And whatever you may be facing or dealing with, I hope this is an encouragement to faithfulness. I hope this helps you find the hope that you need to stay strong and to be faithful and to grow to the glory and honor of God and to remember the crown of life that awaits you if you see this time through and whatever times wait before us and whatever life we have left. To remain faithful at all times. Well, as we draw the sermon to a close, we want to extend the invitation. Perhaps there's someone here who's not ready for eternity. Perhaps there's someone here who knows that the crown of life is not waiting for them because they have not obeyed the gospel. And this is an opportunity for you to do that. And we invite you to make that choice if you need to. If you believe and are ready to repent of your sins and confess the name of Christ, then you're ready to be baptized for the remission of your sins. And we would invite you to make that choice. Or if there's a Christian here, someone who needs the prayers of the church, we'd be happy to pray with you and for you for whatever that may be. So if there be one, we'd invite you to come while we stand and sing this song of invitation.